think crystal yeah and hopefully they'll pop in and tell us if okay looks like we are live hello welcome hello everyone thanks for joining us Hi, seeing people dropping in. Um, we really want to know where you are joining us from. So if you feel up to it, just drop your name and where you are calling into this webinar from, because I know there's people from all over the world joining us this morning, uh, this lunchtime on the Pacific coast of USA. So it'd be great to hear where you are, who you are and where you are. I see Jessica, Bella, Belai, Barbara, Joanna, Hi, Paul from Oregon. Hi, Barbara. Barbara from Oregon, too. I'm here in LA. Ashley and Jonathan are also in Portland. So there's a crew here, obviously, from Portland. Hi, Fernando from Brazil. So nice to have you here. Ah, UK. So do you recognize my accent? I am also British. Well, maybe you're not British. Maybe you're just calling in from the UK. Hi, Jessica, US citizen living in Mexico. Guillaume from Brazil. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Ah, oh, you're Indonesian, but in in the UK. So great to have you all here today with us for this awesome Planetary Health Alliance panel. And we're so grateful to be joining you with the Planetary Health Alliance uh, again for another fantastic year of festival and conference talks. And this panel this morning, um, how radical listening to communities is addressing the climate nature crisis. So we're going to be going through, Jonathan and Ashley are going to be talking through some results that we have um, that were published in our PNAS paper from um, our proof of, proof of concept site, which is ASRI. Some of you, I believe, will probably know ASRI, our site in Borneo, Indonesia. It's so great to see so many people from so many different places. Really great to know, Fernando, that our YouTube is working perfectly. Thanks for that. And so hello to everyone who is joining us via the YouTube channel. Oh, and also, if you weren't able to catch yesterday, we had a fantastic panel yesterday that was about a planetary health approach to COVID um, with Erica Pellegrino, Wayne Walker and Dr. Enrique. Actually, what is Dr. Enrique's surname? Barros, Dr. Enrique Barros. Yeah, so I'm gonna drop the link into that chat there. So to make sure you check out that one in your own time, you can watch it again there. And I guess we'll be ready to get started in a minute or so, right, Ashley? That sounds great, Emma, thanks so much. And warm welcome to everyone uh, from all over the world. I know some of you are getting up early, some of you are staying up late, and we're just totally delighted to be here with you. So thanks for joining us. Um, so Emma, if it's okay with you, uh, perhaps we can kick off with some introductions. Do you want to get started? And then Jonathan? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm joining you today as, your, as the moderator, your moderator, and I am Health and Harmony's Strategic Marketing and Communi Communications Manager. And Jonathan, who are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and attention and interest in, in planetary health in action. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm the executive director of Health and Harmony. I've been the executive director for the last just over four, four years. Um, I spent about 15 years in leadership roles with Doctors Without Borders worldwide. Um, three of the, the last humanitarian crises that I was involved in uh, with the response of were the famine in the Horn of Africa, the Syrian conflict, and then the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And all of these crises share in common the fact that they are driven directly and indirectly by environmental degradation and the climate crisis. So with Doctors Without Borders, I got a little bit frustrated and fatigued with waking up uh, every day, going to work to deal with the, the humanitarian fallout of a sick planet. So I had a, a fortuitous occasion to meet the founder of Health and Harmony, Dr. Kennery Webb, at a time when they were looking for uh, an executive director to, to help them become, help health, help, help health and harmony um, expand our operational footprint internationally. 
And I've been uh, working with Ashley and this amazing team for the last four years or so. Thanks, Emma. Over to you, Ashley. Awesome. Well, thanks, Emma. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Emma does so much more than that, but clearly is also our hype person for the panel. So thank you for that, Emma. I'm Ashley Emerson, the Program Director of Health and Harmony. Uh, so I support our team uh, with our international programs, replication, research, uh, and then work with our marketing comms and fundraising teams too to help get this work done. Uh, we have a really good time and it's also been a really challenging year. Um, but in these times of COVID, we've also been thankful to have a planetary health approach to this pandemic that is going really well. Um, so it's been a bright spot for us. My background and my career has been in international development, working mostly in, in low resource and post-crisis settings in Haiti after the earthquake and West Africa during the Ebola outbreak. Um, spent a lot of time working in Bangladesh and a number of other countries really focused on public health, uh, infrastructure, um, economic development, and education. And oftentimes, just as Jonathan was saying, the environment was left out of the equation, not thought of, and we were constantly thinking about addressing these really complex problems and these siloed approaches. So it was just really floored to find Health and Harmony, an organization that's taking a really intersectional approach to addressing the climate and nature crisis. Uh, so I've been with the team for about four years now, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you all a little bit about um, some recent research that's come out on our, our work. So with that, I'll hand it back to Emma for some housekeeping. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, and it's great to be here with everyone today. And it's uh, just great to uh, just want to reiterate how wonderful it is. Uh, a positive of our virtual lives is that so many of us can be together and yet be in so many different places at the same time. And because we have so many different voices here, we want to hear from you today. Uh, so throughout the conversation with Jonathan and Ashley, please drop your questions and comments into the chat or into the Q&A that's just down there in that little, um, what do you call that? <laughs> I don't even know what you call that, but you'll see it, chat and Q&A. So you can use either of those. Um, yeah, and, and that's really it. And we will have time for questions at the end. Um, yeah, so take it away, Ashley. Thanks so much. So Jonathan, let me go ahead and pull up our slides and hand it back over to you. Okay, fantastic. Let me get set up here. Great. Um, thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Emma. And thanks, everyone, for joining us again. Um, as you all probably well know, humanity has created two crises on planet Earth. We're in one race against global warming, and we're in another race against the collapse of biodiversity. Uh, Ashley, if you could go to the next slide. Now, nearly every ecosystem on the planet is in jeopardy of collapsing as we destroy nature and we drive global heating. The spike in atmospheric carbon dioxide that you see in this graph on the left in the last 60 years and the attending collapse of biodiversity, which you see uh, featured on the cover of this book, these aren't normal ecological processes, and together they are the number one threat to human civilization and to the longevity of countless species. And we've got to act now. We simply have to act now. And in fact, as, as you probably know, scientists overwhelmingly agree that we have until the year 2030 to have atmospheric carbon dioxide, and then we must be carbon neutral by year 2050 in order to avoid the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Ashley, thank you. Now, record high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, these are largely due to rainforest loss. The cutting and burning of forests accounts for about nine, uh, sorry, about 78% of all land-based greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, as rainforest disappears, then thousands of plant and animal species also disappear. Ashley, thank you. Meanwhile, we know from Project Drawdown and from other scientists and projects that one of the most effective and least expensive ways to mitigate global heating is to protect and expand tropical forests which you see here as number five 
on Drawdown's top 10 list of solutions to the climate crisis. Now in the next slide, you'll see uh, a picture of a logger in Indonesia. Now the majority of carbon loss in rainforests is not due to commercial scale clear cutting. It's due to natural fire events and also predominantly to local human caused community-based degradation. And this degradation is mainly because tropical rainforest communities across the globe face grinding impoverishment, including a lack of access to basic needs like healthcare and food security. So while these rainforest communities are the experts in knowing how to live in balance with local rainforest ecosystems, they're just too often left with no choice but to log or mine the rainforest for access to the cash they need to make ends meet and survive. Consistently across the tropics, our Health and Harmony team finds the biggest drivers of rainforest destruction are the costs of healthcare and the costs of medical emergencies and the lack of access to jobs. Ashley, if you can move forward. And so here is where Health and Harmony comes in. We understand that the leadership and expertise of local and indigenous rainforest communities, this is vital to the protection of rainforests. And while these communities only comprise less than about 5% of the world's population, local and indigenous rainforest peoples protect 80% of global biodiversity. So we ignore this fact at our peril. And to develop community-based solutions to reverse deforestation, Health and Harmony enters these rainforest communities and we practice a methodology that we've developed called radical listening. Now, radical listening starts with this simple question. We tell the communities, you are the guardians of a rainforest that is so valuable to the health of the entire planet. How might the rest of the world support you to live in balance with this rainforest as a thank you for your protection of it. And so I want everyone to hear the reciprocity that is built into the initial question that we start the radical listening exercises with. Then we listen, sometimes for hundreds of hours, documenting community solutions, which across the tropics are consistently some combination of improved healthcare access and jobs training. And then, we are committed to investing precisely in their consensus-based solutions to stop logging or stop mining or poaching. We're committed to providing them with the resources they require to implement their designs. So ultimately, we are committed to restoring the agency to these communities because they are the ecological experts in, in understanding how to live in balance with these rainforest ecosystems that are so important to us, regardless of where we live on planet Earth. Ashley? Our mission is simple. We exist to reverse tropical rainforest deforestation, and we do this in order to curb global heating, and we do it for planetary health. How we do it is rather unique. We operate at the intersection of public health and at the, inter uh, the intersection of public health with conservation or ecosystem integrity. Our programs return improved human well being and improved ecosystem integrity. And for those of you that might be new to the planetary health discipline, you know that the fundamental, you may not know that the fundamental definition of planetary health is the health of human civilization and the health of the ecosystems on which our health depends. So this is really important for us. When we call ourselves Planetary Health in Action, it's because Health and Harmony investments, Health and Harmony programs return both improved human well-being and improved ecosystem integrity. And we're doing this uh, really, as I've, I've, I've already laid out, to curb global heating, to combat the climate crisis and the collapse of biodiversity. Okay, Ashley, if we could go to the next slide. Our model is based on these three core components. First, we understand that rainforest communities are the expert. We invest precisely in their solutions. 
Second, we are committed to investing in systems. We are sector agnostic. We know that reversing deforestation is not going to be just about education or just about agriculture or just about health or just about finance. No, these communities consistently design systems-oriented solutions that they need to realize in order to live in balance with their ecosystems. So we do not bring a sector-based approach. And then finally, we conduct our model within the principle of reciprocity. We bridge resources, whether they are available locally, regionally, or inter internationally, we bridge resources back to the community design solutions as a thank you, right? As a thank you for their guardianship of these, uh, sometimes they're called lungs of the planet. In Brazil, we like to think of these rainforests as the heart of the planet. But nevertheless, be they the lungs or the heart, these tropical rainforests globally matter to my health, my family's health, you and your family's health, whether we live in Jakarta, Johannesburg, Tokyo, or right here in Portland, Oregon. Ashley, thank you. Now we know that our radical listening approach works. The effectiveness of our model has been proven to work by Stanford University scientists who analyzed the first 10 years of data from our proof of concept site, that is from our first site, in Indonesian Borneo, where we work beside a population of about 120,000 people to reverse the loss of a massive rainforest in Borneo. Stanford University's analysis culminated in the publication of our impact last November 2020 in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States. And what these researchers found, I would just like to lay it out for you in general, and then we can deep dive a little bit. Stanford University found that between 2007 and 2017, Health and Harmony's 5.2 million US dollar investment in community design solutions resulted in some pretty remarkable things. First, it resulted in a 90% reduction in the number of households relying on logging for their livelihood. Critical where the I'm just going to pause just for a second and ask my children to be quiet. I'm back. So a 90% reduction in the number of households relying on logging as a livelihood. Now, this helped to avert the loss of approximately 65 million U.S. dollars worth of above ground carbon. Now that's to say nothing of below ground carbon or the carbon in, in, in the secondary growth that I'll talk about in a second. What this means is in the subject area during that decade, the rate of logging was less than it was in our synthetic control groups. And the difference in that rate of logging is equivalent to 65.3 million US dollars worth of carbon. And so in our advocacy efforts, this is how we explain to the US government and to governments and to multilaterals like the World Health Organization and the Global Environmental Facility, this return in carbon protected is how governments can pay for this new approach to health system strengthening. In addition, Stanford researchers found that uh, 21,000 hectares or approximately 50,000 acres of forest regrew. This forest is habitat for approximately 20% of the world's remaining population of endangered Bornean orangutans. So 20% of the population of the, of the Bornean orangutan uh, are experiencing improved and enlarged habitat. And finally, in our hospital's catchment area of approximately 100, 120,000 people, we saw some pretty terrific health co-benefits. For example, a 67% reduction in infant mortality, and we saw consistent reduction in the prevalence of common morbidities, such as malaria, tuberculosis, and diarrheal diseases. Now, one thing I, I always like to, to, to say is from our friend, Michelle Berry, 
She is the director of Stanford's Center for Innovation and Global Health. Dr. Barry said, and I quote, Health and Harmony's innovative model has clear global health implications. Health and climate can and should be addressed in unison and done in coordination with and respect for local communities, which in my mind sums up Health and Harmony's raison d'etre. So we are working to make our members to be able to invest directly in the local uh, and indigenous wisdom in these rainforests to reverse their loss. Ashley, if we could go to the next slide. And just very quickly, um, it's both remarkable and I think quite obvious that our uh, impact is implicated in multiple UN sustainable development goals. So the work that we're doing is returning outcomes across goal three, eight, 13, 15, and 17. And I think this is also very obvious because once you take an interdependent approach to program implementation, and when you ask rainforest communities what they need to live in balance with ecosystems, of course, you're going to be um, trying to reverse their poverty, improving their access to education, improving their health and their well being, and also improving life on land and conservation related SDGs, clearly, climate action. Um, so, one of the major uh, advocacy priorities that we have is to convince others like us, be they international NGOs or multilaterals like the WHO or governments like the government of Indonesia or the US. We're trying to convince these other actors that integrated, interdependent, holistic investments are the key to overcoming so many of these grand challenges that we face today. Thanks, Ashley. Now, before I turn it over to Ashley to walk you through some of the details of our programming and the outcomes of our, our, our paper, um, this slide is directly from the paper and it gives you an overview of the problem solution outcome analysis that we've put together with Stanford. And Ashley, I'm just gonna stop there and turn it over to you if that's okay. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. Okay. So um, to, to do this analysis, we had a team of um, people on the ground in Indonesia called Forest Guardians. And when asked, you know, how do we really monitor and how do we track the reduction in folks logging illegally in the park? the communities decided to design their own system. And what they did was hire people from each of the communities, over 30 communities surrounding the park um, and called them forest guardians. And what they did was go out and monitor uh, logging illegally that was happening in the national park. Of course, there were no punitive repercussions for the logging. We knew oftentimes it was based on uh, dire circumstances and needs. Um, so many stories of people cutting down trees to save uh, their wife who had an emergency C-section or child who had been injured. Again, this is their greatest resource. And so the forest guardians were out you know, monitoring, but also eventually their role changed over time. And they began working with uh, loggers to refer them to our sister organization, Alam Sehat Lastari or Asri, uh, to be able to receive services, to receive discounts on healthcare for reducing logging, to become integrated into um, the programs and opportunities that the communities were designing. And so at the same time, these uh, forest guardians were monitoring how many people were logging and what that looked like. So we correlated that ground truthing data with LIDAR data um, across uh, canopy cover in Indonesia to look at other like national parks and understand was Gunung Palang different? You know, did these interventions, in particular the health intervention, have an impact on um, forest cover stabilization and therefore carbon? And what we found was that yes, in fact, it definitely did. The nice thing was that we saw a, a steep drop in the number of folks logging illegally at our 
five uh, year survey that we do with communities. And so it was nice to just see that what the forest guardians were collecting for data was also highly correlated with what we saw in LIDAR. Um, and also just seeing that, you know, the, the access to healthcare um, did have a dramatic reduction on logging. So again, these, these brilliant interconnected solutions that were coming from communities, they owned them, uh, they believed in them and they designed them and iterated them as needs changed. And so that was really a nice way for uh, Austrian Health and Harmony to, to respond and improve programming. That's usually done through you know, very distinct monitoring and evaluation and technical aspects of this work. But in the reality of it, if you just slow down and listen to communities, they can tell you, okay, we need this intervention now that this need is met. We need to change or adapt this part of the program so that we can meet this need. And so that iterative process has been so critical to be able to continue to see the stabilization and regrowth of the forest. So this paper was wonderful. Uh, it was really helpful for us to better understand, you know, we think this is a win-win solution. Is it one? And um, a team at Stanford that Jonathan talked about went along and assessed over 13,000 um, pieces of literature that claimed to be win-win solutions and found that only six of them really had grounded, solid data uh, and showing that this was one of those solutions. I also just wanna say in this research collaboration with Stanford, at the heart of this and the people who really did you know, the surveys and the clinic uh, data collection and that work are our Indonesian colleagues. And so, you know, we're thrilled to be published in a top tier journal to have a group of brilliant scientists work with us on this. Um, but we really have to acknowledge our colleagues in Indonesia um, who were really responsible for the work and for the research. Um, and so what we did, once we had a better sense of the efficacy of the model was we quickly began replicating it because we wanted to understand, you know, given the climate crisis that Jonathan talked about, the IPCC report, you know, the seventh mass extinction, the pressure that we're under feeling the effects of the climate crisis in all of our lives, um, could we move faster? Could we have a bigger impact on forest? Uh, could we sequester more carbon and help cool the planet, uh, save more species and in turn uh, enhance well-being for rainforest communities? So the first replication site was in a park about twice the size of Gunung Palung called Bukit 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 Raya. And then we moved on to replicate the program in Manumbu Special Reserve in Madagascar, as well as the Shingu River Basin in the Brazilian Amazon. And both the Madagascar and Brazil programs uh, were launched during COVID. And so we've been able to really understand, you know, how does this COVID climate shock affect our ability to be able to move forward? Uh, and what we found is it, it forced us to move faster. And so also as Jonathan explained, you know, in this process of replicating and radically listening, communities were asking for the same things. Uh, and, and we were pretty shocked by this, particularly in Brazil, where in Indonesia, we had worked alongside communities who were uh, taking matters into their own hand. They were you know, logging in the forest to be able to address their survival needs. Whereas in Brazil, communities are being encroached upon. And so there's land grabbing and cattle ranching uh, and soy farming um, and, and slash and burn agriculture, which is oftentimes out of the hands um, of, of the indigenous traditional and rainforest communities. And a lot of these processes are state incentivized under the current Bolsonaro administration. But via shortwave radio in the beginning of the pandemic, communities said, you know, we leave our land and they protect and preserve these massive tracts of land in the Brazilian Amazon. We leave our land because we need access to healthcare. It's too far away. It's too expensive to get there, even though it's free. You know, when we get to the city, navigating the city in itself is a very complicated process. So this kind of blew our minds. And, and again, we said, okay, we have an opportunity to again, work alongside communities um, and really focus on these three interconnected areas of request, healthcare, livelihoods, and education. So I just wanna come back to Osri, uh, this proof of concept site, our sister organization that has been doing this work for over 13 years. 
um, and, and how the design grew and improved over time. And here you see a state-of-the-art medical center that sits on the periphery of this magnificent rainforest where you hear gibbons in the background, orangutans are nesting um, right you know, behind this medical center and the isolation units in the back of this medical center that are now being used for COVID um, really integrate the theory of, of Shinrin-yoku and forest dwelling and the healing nature, the, the healing potential nature has on, on people. And so again, just being surrounded by nature in this hospital uh, are co-housed the conservation teams. So you have medical teams and conservation teams and planetary health educators um, who work out of this medical center. And we think this is just such an interesting and progressive model. And so about 120 people travel here per year, uh, doctors, nurses, students, practitioners, to learn from these planetary health experts, to see what it looks like in practice uh, in this center and in communities. One of the really interesting designs um, that helped improve the impact of these interventions on forest stabilization and regrowth was were these incentive systems that communities designed. Um, so one example of that is, you know, people can pay for their health care, which is more of a token concept uh, than a financial investment, but people can pay for their health care with seedlings or other non-cash means like handicrafts or manure. And then those are used in regeneration of the forest. So uh, reforestation, uh, the manure is used in agriculture and gardening. At the same time, people receive a discount on their health care at the village level um, when their village decreases logging. And so we call this the red green system. Essentially, it's a conservation contract. It looks very different depending on the country in which we work. Uh, so in Madagascar, for instance, the conservation contract is upheld by local law. It's not something that's established in books, but it's something that's established um, in the culture. And so people agree to decrease extraction, uh, logging for coal and um, exotic woods uh, to be able to, again, receive discounts on healthcare. And then in terms of the sustainable agriculture and livelihood and training programs, communities, again, designed really fascinating interventions. So when saying, what do you need to be able to transition away from logging in the forest? Uh, in around Gunung Palang, folks said, we want to farm. We want to get back to organic farming. We know that's better for the soil, better for the water, and better for the forest, and better for our children in the future. Um, and so many of those loggers transitioned into organic farming. And for the ones who couldn't, who, who didn't have land, for instance, um, they were able to transition out of logging um, through a program we call Chainsaw Buyback. And so again, communities designed a program where we could make an angel investment in their small businesses, buy their chainsaw. And then on the right here, you see Agus, who is responsible for individually coaching um, families and people would receive this angel investment, not just for the logger, but also for their partner. And he would coach them in marketing, budget, um, and management of their businesses. And so instead of starting one business, you typically saw families starting two, three, four businesses. Now in Madagascar, communities asked for, again, livelihood support, medical support, and education support. Um, and because of the, the landscape and folks are oftentimes walking long distances to access healthcare, they designed a public health system where everyone could reach it. And so they said, we want you to set up uh, mobile clinics in these seven different areas around the park so we can get there. And we want you to run them every day um, so that we know that we have consistent access. And at the same time, we want training in, in SRI rice ag and agriculture so that we can diversify our diets, but have this training ahead of cyclone season and have this training ahead of lean season. Because what these communities are experiencing is, is chronic malnutrition, lack of diversity in diet. Uh, and so really they're seeking training and food security. Uh, and what was remarkable was to see how successful it was. And so first yields of rice have been harvested. They're far more abundant. Uh, and so there's, again, communities have designed it, they've bought into it, and then they're experiencing 
feeling and seeing the fruits of that investment. A part of a program that communities didn't directly ask for, but because of the severe degradation of Manubu Special Reserve was reforestation. And so we tied reforestation into uh, agriculture and agroforestry to, to be able to support um, essentially a buffer economy around the forest that would support communities being able to grow trees that were fruiting and would bear uh, products and resources for them to eat and sell. Um, but they're also great for lemurs. And in Manubu Special Reserve, you have nine lemur species, all of which are endangered, uh, two, maybe three at this point, of which are critically endangered. So again, a win-win for, for communities and for the species uh, within the forest. And this is what a mobile clinic looks like in, in Madagascar. Uh, very, very basic infrastructure. The team of 14 or so uh, piles into two vans uh, and they go ahead and, and make the rounds around the forest. They pull in um, uh, doctors and nurses from the Ministry of Health, from the local CSB posts, which are, is kind of the current public health network and infrastructure. And then they partner with the local medical university. Um, to help support outreach clinics, et cetera. And this is what agriculture training looks like. 60% of the participants are women. Um, and after training in SRI, SRI Rice and graduating from that program, folks have requested to um, move into other forms of training like diversified agriculture, reforestation, agroforestry, et cetera. Um, so we're excited to see how well this is going, particularly at the start of the pandemic, um, being able to do these programs at a social distance, encouraging mask wearing um, has been uh, challenging, but so far successful. And lastly, I just wanna share with you um, a little perspective on our, our latest programs working alongside communities in the Brazilian Amazon and the Shingu River Basin. And so when you think about um, the Shingu River Basin, What's important to remember is this is the cornerstone track of the Amazon of forest that keeps this place intact, the degradation of which is what really creates this tipping point for the Brazilian Amazon. So on the right side of this circle, you can see all of these yellow, green, red, we call this the arc of deforestation. So this part of rainforest is really just sitting on the arc of deforestation. Why you see this forest so uh, distinctively intact is because you have indigenous, traditional and rainforest communities living in this tract of land, protecting, preserving, supporting it and defending it from all the pressures I mentioned earlier. When we ask communities this question, you know, what do you need as a thank you for doing this work? They said, um, you know, we need healthcare. We need emergency, emergency evacuations during COVID, we need telemedicine. And so Wi-Fi hotspots to be able to have our nurses and communities converse with the medical centers and universities in Altamira so that we don't have to leave our land, we don't have to leave the community and that we can access resources here where we live. Um, and, and also, you know, again, basic infrastructure. So increase in number of personnel, vaccines, et cetera. So what that looked like uh, from a medical perspective was setting up a boat, filling it with supplies, bringing in um, personnel to be able to respond to these requests. And we couldn't have done it without incredible staff and really wonderful partners. So um, Instituto Socioambiental, ISA, who has historically focused on forest economy, pivoted and really has been working alongside us to be able to support communities. The Federal University of Para, and um, you know, working with the local associations of indigenous and traditional people um, who've really been the portal to these communities. So this is just a little um, overview of the past several months, what these teams have been able to do. Uh, our friend Marcelo Salazar and Dr. Erica Pellegrino who run this program in Brazil um, have made multiple trips up into the Shingu to be able to um, yeah, support the communities with some of these requests, in addition to bringing things like dental services up. And if you can imagine what it looks like to, to uh, equip a boat with a dental suite and then unload that in communities, they're spending you know, 15 to 20 days 
up there and their next trip, they'll be bringing COVID vaccines for elders in the communities. And from there, I just want to um, leave you with this message. Um, our friend Marcelo Salazar um, shared this with us. And this picture was taken by uh, a dear friend of his and of Health and Harmony, um, Lilo, who just lost his life to COVID. Um, so our hearts go out to him and his family um, during what has been an incredibly difficult time in Brazil. And here you have an indigenous elder who predicted and talks about pandemics and what happens when we cut down the forest and the impact that that has on the winds and the changing of climate and the effects on hydric cycling. You know, we oftentimes appreciate these papers, like the one that we talked about that was published in PNAS and Western science, but it is truly the indigenous science and the other ways of knowing that we need to come back to, that we need to uphold and listen to and invest in, because these are the answers, this is the insight, and this is the direction that we really need to be able to prevent the next pandemic. And so with that, I will hand it back over to Jonathan. Thanks, Ashley. <clears throat> so we really look forward to your questions and your, your discussion. Mm -hmm. um, we would also love for you to connect with us at Health and Harmony. Uh, we'd love for you to be, be part of what we do. Uh, there's different ways you can do that. You can sign up to our newsletter. Uh, of course, you can donate. Uh, we're a nonprofit, a 501c3 here in the U.S., um, so we survive on, on the, the kindness and the generosity of, of people and institutions. And please follow us on social media. Um, and you, you can see how to do that right there on this slide. Um, thank you so much for your own dedication to planetary health. I'm sure many of you are doing incredible work, and I would love to hear more about it if we can uh, through the chat. Uh, but you're 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 invited to drop us an email. If we can work with you in Kenya, if we can work with you in Canada, if we can work with you wherever you are, we would like to learn from you. And if we can bring you value, so much the better. So really, thanks so much. Uh, Emma, I'll turn it back over to mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so just seeing a couple of questions coming into the chat. And as Jonathan said, please do keep asking questions. We've got a bit of time here, 15 or so minutes left. So time to answer a few questions. Uh, the first one here for you, Ashley, is from Mike and Peggy Kan Kanaga. Uh, let me oh, know. Oh, great. I yeah. Pronounce that correctly. Uh, okay, so Mike and Peggy are asking, what is the Health and Harmony current estimated cycle time for identifying a, a new target area and getting a program up to speed and then producing positive results? Then they have another yeah, question. Yeah, that's a great like question. We have, we have that question for ourselves. And as I said, given the pressure of climate change, we're trying to condense what we did in 13 years in Indonesia down to a three-year cycle. So being able to radically listen, co-design interventions, get funding and have impact. And the program in Madagascar is a good example of that. A full suite of interventions were started at once. We're already seeing impact on food security, reforestation and health. Um, but ultimately what we really wanna be seeing is stabilization of the forest, which we know in turn also re re results in um, well-being of communities. What we didn't talk about is scale. We know we can't keep replicating at the rate that we are and have a large impact. So we are engaging in advocacy uh, as well as a tech enabled solution. So working on a website that would help communities more directly connect with people like us who wanna invest in their solutions and be able to see the impact that those are having and then partnerships. So looking at um, who is the highest quality partner that we can work with globally to address the health care needs, livelihood needs, and education requests from communities. And Mike and Peggy had a follow-up, actually, what resources would help Health in Harmony reduce that cycle time? That cycle. Yeah, the biggest challenge right now is we function in a landscape of donors who are highly siloed, and so they very traditionally follow um, this colonial context of dissecting humans from the environment. We have a small 
group of incredibly generous and wonderful donors who understand and appreciate the interconnection of human well being and the well being of nature. And they support us. We need more of those type of large institutional donors. Um, and with saying that, we're so thankful for the individual donors who support us to do this work. But at the end of the day, we know what works. We have the model. We listen to indigenous traditional and rainforest communities. And that's at the heart of what we do. That's, that's scalable. And we know that. Our, back, our next big challenge is that LEAP funding that we're looking for. Mike and Peggy, thank you. You guys, thank you very much. Major thank you to you. Uh, so another question from Belai, and I think this is Belai who was um, working at ASRI, and I believe just before the pandemic started, maybe uh, Belai, you can put it in the chat if that is you. Ah, oh! and Belai is a fantastic musician as well. So yeah, drop your um, Instagram into the chat because people should follow you and your wonderful creativity should be shared more with the world. Um, thank you. So Belay's question is, what were some of the challenges you faced in implementing radical listening and how did you overcome them? Wow, great question. Um, I, I think COVID has presented us with the biggest challenge, uh, especially in Brazil, and I'll let Ashley give you the details of actually how we conducted radical listening um, in the Shingu Basin of the Brazilian Amazon. In Madagascar, um, we were conducting our radical listening, the initial, the initial radical li listening exercises sort of before COVID. Um, COVID has definitely presented us with ma major challenges and major opportunities. Uh, before I turn it over to Ashley, I will say that radical listening is an iterative process. So it, 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 obviously is at the very front end of everything we do, but it, it continues throughout as a way of um, improving, learning, and building forward with the communities. Ashley, do you want to talk a little bit about how we overcame uh, some logistical and, and technical challenges that COVID threw at us in the Shingu Basin? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We thought we had to do, we thought we had to radically listen in person, and it finds out we don't. We can do it if we have strong relationships to people who um, are trusted by the community. And we had that through our, our current program um, managers in Brazil. And so they were able to use shortwave radio, WhatsApp and translators to speak with communities um, and ask them this question. You know, and, and to your question, Belay, I think the biggest challenge with radical listening from our perspective is it requires a deep deconstruction of historical coloniality, racism, othering and, and a reimagining of, of what this means to communities and a reimagining of the interconnection um, of, of humans and their environment. And, and I mean that for people, you know, more typically in the global north, more typically. Um, yeah, so, so let me say that. And, and from the community side, we oftentimes find ourselves working in communities who have been on the other end of, of the oppression of colonization uh, and then the development industry. And so there's this real deconstruction that has to happen in that process. When we sit and ask people, what do you need? Uh, communities are used to telling organizations what they think we wanna hear, but that's not what we wanna hear. And so there has to be this back and forth process of really just deconstructing um, those expectations. And, um, and we're still learning. So it's a great question, thank you. Yeah, and just to follow up from Balai on that, uh, was how easy or difficult was it to gain the trust of the communities until they were able to give their inputs and feedback openly? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, I was in Madagascar doing um, the initial assessments and some of the initial work. And I have spent 20 or more years um, with mainly with Doctors Without Borders around former Yugoslavia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia. And in Madagascar, it was very um, telling, I think. When we sat down, the very first meetings with communities, they had very scripted answers. You could, you know, you could, very scripted um, responses. Um, and finally, after about an hour with us, one of the sort of outspoken um, women leaders stood up and said, look, 
you guys are different from the other NGOs that have been coming in here for the last 15 years asking, you know, similar sorts of questions. Um, I think, and she looked at her, at, at her community members around her and said, I think we can actually be a little bit more um, honest. Um, we, can, we can tell them what we know, what we think, what, what, what we believe to be the real solutions. And I thought that was very telling, Bly. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but building the trust, it takes a long, long time. Don't get me wrong. Um, we, we, we endeavor to work with um, Brazilian, Malagasy, Indonesian colleagues, um, and, and they really are critical in building the trust with their communities. Um, Ashley, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, well said. Thanks. And we just have a couple more questions and I've got confidence that we can get through both of these and wrap up on time. Uh, so the first one is from Claire Wolfowitz. Hi, Claire. So nice to have you here. Uh, can you comment on the famine situation in southern Madagascar? Yeah, it's dire, you know, 1.3 million people on the brink of famine. Um, food rations that are being handed out, uh, half the amount that people need because of budget constraints. And, and this has been a pretty consistent story in Madagascar, a place that um, really struggles with food security, uh, under five stunting, malnutrition. We see it every day in our work there. And, and part of the big challenge is unpredictable rains. Um, and, and, and cyclone seasons, particularly in the South um, that come through and destroy crops. So, you know, a big focus of our work is on food security and we appreciate that there needs to be uh, a response to the immediate need. Um, you know, here's an example of, a, you know, a part of the world that suffers from the effects of the massive carbon emissions from the global North. And so, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to take responsibility here, uh, do what we can, um, support communities, whether it's through donations or whatever it may be. But we all have a part to play in this. Uh, and I think the short term solution is unfolding again in, in food support. But the long term solution really has to be around, you know, food resilience, the trainings that the communities asked for, but ultimately cooling our planet and restoring um, the expectations around seasonality that communities need to be more food secure. Thanks, Claire, for the question. And thanks, Ashley, for such a comprehensive thanks, answer. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. And I'm going to try and find, uh, there was actually a film on Madagascar that has been screened as part of the Planetary Health Festival. So I'm going to try and find that and drop the link in the chat so you can see what's going on with our program there. A fantastic video that's just been released. So one more question. And, and um, it's also about the climate crisis and sustainability. So good segue into this one. And this is from someone anonymous. Um, but how is climate action going together with uh, the Health and Harmony offer of Experience Borneo, Borneo in 10 to 15 days? They say a short trip like this, probably traveling by plane is really not sustainable. So just some thoughts on that from you both would be great. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's not, right? It's not sustainable. I think we justify it because this is the world, as far as we're aware of, this is the world's one and only example of a planetary health system. What I mean by that is the last 50 or 100 years of global health practice has focused on the population and individuals of one species, us, to the neglect of our, de our dependence on nature and the ecological determinants of our health. So as we attempt to impress upon the rest of the world the importance of building health systems that look like what we and our Indonesian colleagues at Osri have built in Borneo, we think it's important for professionals, medical and non-medical, et cetera, to see it in action. Um, we'd like for them to come and stay longer. Uh, this, is, and this is all pre-COVID, right? COVID has changed the game entirely. We, we can't do it now. We don't do it now. Um, but we feel like we're justified in showing the world, you know, they can touch it, they can smell it, they can, they can, they can see it with their own eyes, and they can take it back home, uh, something that they've learned, they can take it back home to Stockholm, or to Nairobi, or to, you know, wherever they come from, be they medical, non-medical, business, um, it doesn't, you know, conservationists, it doesn't matter the, 
the 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 professional um you know their professional focus so while we understand that it is um emitting carbon we we justify it because it is a microcosm of what we need to see health systems looking like worldwide we also and this will be some consolation it, it may not be enough for you um, we offset all of that carbon through our reforestation programs. In, a, in addition to what we are already reforesting strategically, we add on to that um, the carbon that, that is a, enough planting to, to draw down the equivalent amount of carbon that's released during the flights back and forth to Borneo. Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. And thanks for that question, really important one. So we have a couple of minutes to wrap up. Ashley, back to you. Yeah, just to say um, we are trying to online in this new virtual world we live in, as exhausting as it may be uh, for many of us, uh, there's huge advantages that we see in terms of reducing carbon. We are going carbon neutral as an organization. We gave up our office. We no longer commute. Um, we're bringing this planetary health education online. We're bringing radical listening online. Um, so it's a big part of our responsibility too. So, so yeah, just a thanks again for that question. Um, and thanks all for your participa participation in this conference. It's a great one uh, and there's so few like it. And it's wonderful to see it move from, you know, being together for two or three days, accessible to a few, uh, to a two week conference and festival now where we can all come together uh, and it's accessible to so many more people. Um, and also kudos to the planners in, in Brazil and the Planetary Health Alliance um, for really doing the right thing and in integrating indig indigenous leadership and voices and other ways of knowing um, into this conference and particularly through the work of Dr. Redvers. Uh, we've been honored more than ever to be part of this. So um, thanks all for joining and thanks for your interest in this research and our work more importantly. Uh, and, and for your support. Special thanks to our friend Emma for keeping us going, for moderating, keeping us in order. Um, thanks, Emma. And to Jonathan. Oh, thank you guys you. are terrific. Thank you both so much. And thanks, <laughs> thank everybody. You. Yeah, thanks for being here. And just to let you all know, I've dropped a bunch of information, hopefully not overloading you, but we want you to be part of our mission uh, and, and join Planetary Health in Action serving these rainforest communities. So you can follow us on social media. You can donate to us today. That would be fantastic. You can also sign up to our newsletter. And very exciting, our founder, Kinnery Webb, Dr. Kinnery Webb, has a book out on Flatiron in September. So just posted the link to that book website, Guardians of the Trees. Go and buy it now, but after you've donated to us. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Emma. Thank you all. Take